Gary Hader. Uh, I'm founder of uh, past president of the Goldfish Council. I'm going to talk to you about breeding goldfish and raising fry. And uh, I hope you like it. So, um, background: I've been breeding uh, goldfish for since 1980, and tropicals before that. Um, and um, I've got the old copy of the presentation. So give me a minute. Uh, sorry about that. Okay. So I started with um, red cap arandas and I uh, moved into veil tails of all sorts, broad tails. Uh, Ranchu, uh, Shabunkins, a couple other things. Uh, fundamentally, uh, I've gone through about 15 different uh, lines of fish. Uh, I'm responsible for the Breeder Social and um, the 20th anniversary of the Breeder Social. If you've never heard of it, it's because you're not a fish breeder. So we typically, my wife and I host a Breeder's uh, Review and Social once a year, we've done it for 20 times over the last 23 years. So, um, long story short, over a thousand years ago, these fish were domesticated or semi-domesticated. And uh, uh, we've moved to looking at reading basics of these fish. And uh, I, I would say, long story short, you have to hibernate them unless they're the first time breeder, breeders. And after you hibernate them, it, it, when spring comes, they spawn. And they spawn more than once often, sometimes two or three times. And um, if, you, uh, if you're breeding them by hand spawning, you expose the, ma the males first and then the eggs. And uh, from there, you're ready to, ready to go. Um, can any can you people see the screen at all? Sorry, it's the best I can do with the bright sunlight. But most of us have moved to spawning mops, and instead of the old nylon mops and yarn mops that we used to use, we almost all use cheerleader pom poms now, which are available in the dollar store or if you like Oriental trading and buy them in bulk so you can get the color of your choice. But they're just a simple uh, dollar uh, cheerleader pom pom like uh, uh, cheaters are used for practice or for a game and the fish like them better than yarn and that they appear to be softer and the fish are more interested in hiding in them. Uh, a couple pictures of my rancher collection and uh, I appreciate, uh, apologize for the brightness but there's nothing I can do about it. But big, big two or three uh, mops, uh, rubber band and the fish uh, wake up and <coughs> There's several males and females breeding at the same time in a corner of the tank. Um, eggs are laid either on mops or hand spawn in the bowls. They hatch four to five days. Uh, you as a keeper uh, generally aerate the eggs in a bowl 
uh, with or without, and if they're on mops, you can put the mops in water and aerate it. I tend to change, wa change water on those mops on day two and day three. And then on day three, uh, four and five, I do nothing but watch to see if they start swimming. Once they hatch, they cling to the side, and uh, if they clung to the side of the tank, <coughs> you largely do it, nothing. No feeding, no water changes. You wait until they're swimming, and then you feed them. It's typically once, or well, after the first feeding, then I move them to a tank from the poles. Um, the fish are out, they've hatched, they're attached to the side of the bowl, you're all excited, and the first thing you do now is you don't feed them, you hatch brine shrimp, and you, uh, but you wait a day. You, the fish, once they hatch, they cling to the side of the glass or the side of a bowl or whatever they were born on, and they, they wait until their egg sac is absorbed. Once that egg sac is absorbed, they start swimming and looking for food, that's when you feed them. <clears throat> so if you feed them too early, you end up killing all the fry. And, and so you're better off just sitting and watching. And I know it's nerve wracking, but there's no reason to feed the fish until that egg sac is done and they're literally swimming about the tank. So most of us hatch brine shrimp instead of green water. And some people, <clears throat> have gone to Golden Pearls as a supplemental food or as an instead of food. You can buy, buy uh, Golden Pearls in any different, uh, any number of sizes. Most people use zero to 500 micron to start with and gradually move up to something much bigger. <clears throat> the fish uh, are now approximately four days old and you feed them for the first time. These fish, um, those little dots, uh, those fish are probably two weeks old, but initially you see nothing but a bunch of eyes uh, swimming around and they're clear. And you feed a little bit of live brine shrimp and after you fed the live brine shrimp, the fish are no longer transparent. You can see the, the shrimps inside the body. And from there, it's then feeding gradually more until you're feeding them several times a day. And um, most of us had salt to the tank that the babies are in so that we can feed more brine shrimp and the brine shrimp extends itself. Instead of dying off after a couple hours, it'll last 24 hours. So you only have to feed them one large amount uh, at a time. Uh, we feed them predominantly live brine shrimp uh, once to twice a day. Some people are, are doing it the old fashioned way and they're feeding it three and four times a day. That kind of wears me out. So anyway, but uh, feed them once a day with salt in the water, so the live shrimp brine shrimp stays longer. Uh, we gradually add uh, something like golden pearls, um, flake food, uh, micro pelleted food, and then approximately uh, three to four weeks, we start adding steamed eggs, and uh, almost everybody's doing the steamed eggs thing in some shape or form. It's uh, basically equal volumes of water uh, and, and raw eggs uh, blended with some chopped garlic. <clears throat> and you can add other ingredients uh, like spirulina and stuff. And you want to steam them for a period of uh, six to eight minutes, which is not very long. And then you let them sit in the, uh, with the heat turned off for another 30 minutes and you end up with a custard-like material that is uh, very wet and uh, first time you make it successfully you kind of look like it and you go mm, this can't be done but if it's too hard it, you've gone too far you've cooked it too long and so you want it runny so that if you would flick it with a spoonful of it it would hit the water surface and break into a million pieces so, so there's a picture of a uh, three-week-old fish with a glob of uh, steamed eggs and a big chunk out of a teaspoon here and all these little snowflakes once the fish uh, start eating it they think it's kind of big sport to eat through it and they just kind of run through it and you have all these little pieces and they gradually go back and feed them eat them
another side view piece and basically the fish um, chew on that and they'll eat it for five and six hours sometimes. So it's really nice instead of trying to jam four or five meals in them when they're real small, uh, you, you basically feed them once in the morning and might feed them uh, right before dinner <coughs> and um, the, fish, the fish can feed almost all day long. So, um, things to do with and without steam uh, and not do with steam bags. It's best to feed them more than once a day. It's best to keep them solidly eating all day long. Um, most people recommend a 50% water change daily. Uh, we typically use a tight net or siphon off all the residual egg crumbs on the bottom of the tank. <clears throat> and uh, most people are, look at fish that are fairly large, up to an inch long, and they wonder if they should still be feeding eggs. And the answer is most most breeders now are feeding them one meal a day steamed eggs, regardless of the size. And uh, what we're finding <clears throat> is that if the big fish are getting steamed eggs, by the time you get through your fish room and say you've got, I don't know, let's say you have five tanks or six tanks, you'll feed them. By the time you get done feeding them, the number one and number two tank, the eggs are gone, and then they go back and do a second feeding immediately of pellets. So you'll have two feedings into the fish, and you've already been in your fish room for about 10 minutes. And uh, made, it's made a big difference on the way we grow fish. They get, they get explosively large very quickly. A couple things not to do is uh, you can never have leftovers over 12 hours. It's, you end up with really bad water quality. Uh, you have to remember the steamed eggs are perishable and you can keep them for 10 days if they have garlic in them. And um, if you keep them much longer than 12 days and the, and the odor changes, you probably should throw them out. Lastly, you cannot freeze steamed eggs. You freeze them and you end up with a really ugly mess when you're done. So, um, so uh, a really bad subject, I think, is, is that lots of people don't like culling a fish and uh, if you're gonna stay in the hobby, you have to realize that uh, a, a good line of fish yields only 10 to 20% the eggs are, are keepable as mature fish that would meet what you would call standards or are quality fish. The other ones have some type of flaw. Fins are broken, fins are too short, missing fins, uh, any number of things. And so um, it's, it's difficult for some people to imagine uh, that you can only keep 10% of the fish and you have to raise a thousand of them or something like that. But that's what happens. And when you look at Ranchu and Jeekin and Vale Tales and Tosakin, the numbers can be really even smaller. And, and, and lots of breeders who have kept any of those lines for a long time are not selling their offspring. They're not pet, pet storing their offspring. They're only keeping that, that small number of fish for themselves. And when that happens, the numbers really drop into a really small, uh, something like six, seven percent often. So, just borrow from the internet with permission. But you can see, um, you end up with looking at the fish from the top. I don't care what fish they are top view, side view, the sockets, single tail, whatever. <clears throat> you look at it from the top when you go to sort them. And initially, it's the tail. Either the tail is perfect or the tail is bent. And if the tail is bent, you, you keep the one bent, uh, they all go away. And that's about half of the scale. And then if they're a double tail, like a male tail or a ryokin or a uh, uh, butterfly, if the fish are supposed to be like this, and this is their tail, this part is not open, you, you don't keep it because it never opens. And so 
if you look at that, this fish down here, it's all joined. And so those fish, unless you're breeding for Sopkins, we throw those away. When I say throw it away, you sort them out. And um, you also get deformities like crooked spines and really, really tiny tails. Um, it's really difficult for some people to do this. And I can only say that if you've kept the line, uh, I've kept uh, a line of, of Bristol's and I kept a line of Philadelphia Vale Tails for over 20 years. And it, now it's really easy for me. I can take those fish and put them in there. And I know that line from the year before and the year before that and the year before that. And it, it, they, they just fall out. You know which ones don't, don't stay. So. <clears throat> and uh, this is one of my favorite slides. A couple things. This guy that never owned a fish in his life. A good friend of mine. I went to grade school and high school with him. We still hang out. And I taught him how to call fish. So anybody can call fish. I can tell you that. The other thing is you all recognize this, right? No? See, then you don't have a plastic Christmas wreath on your front door. But this is a Christmas wreath keeper. You know, for storing Christmas wreaths from year to year. But anyway. Uh, big broad dish, put the fish in it, the whole spawn, uh, you keep it about an inch deep and you have two buckets uh, typically and you either do a positive sort which means you're picking out the good ones or a negative sort and if it's too crowded sometimes you have to do some of each and so we'll sort through them and uh, if the two of us are doing it we can go through maybe five or six thousand fish in a couple hours. And so it's not that you're looking for that best fish because at this size. These fish, I start calling between two and three weeks. And I hear of people doing it earlier and they do it with things like magnifying glasses and all this kind of stuff. I, I don't do any of that. And I, I tend to keep them. And so when, it's, and when I call them, it's comfortable that you can see them. And <clears throat> The other thing is, really small fish, you really shouldn't be handling them with a net. You, you're damaged, potentially damaging your scales and fins. So. There's my fa a friend, Bao Dang, uh, in Columbus, Ohio. He comes down and you can see. It's kind of a social thing. What are you doing this weekend? Oh, nothing. It's too cold and miserable outside in the Midwest. So he comes down and does fish with me. And then, uh, if you want to do a whole bunch of fish, you take your grandkids and have them over. They're uh, 13 and 15, and they want to brought one of their buddies, and you tell them exactly what you want. And that's, I tell you, that's the only thing. That you so that, that's kind of problematic sometimes because you're looking at stuff and you find something that's really kind of unique. And I'll, I'll keep that. Well, if you have trained people with really good eyes that are pretty young, they'll go through and they'll give you exactly what you asked for, which is. I don't know. Still ended up with great fish, but uh, some of the uh, some of the oddball things like uh, uh, an odd odd scale type or something like that, they won't notice that. You know, if they're not trained on. But uh, kids enjoyed it. It was a crummy day. You know. So, so here's kind of a, 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 a. Can you see that? Yes. No. Maybe not. So, but you know, this is a quarter. So these fish are about two-thirds of an inch long and the keepers these happen to be ranchu so the lead fin ray is almost perpendicular to the body that's called the tail shoulder in, in ranchu the tail shoulders like this really here's the body it's like this this no good you know this way no good yeah, but you know it, it, it it's very close to perpendicular and the tail has to be split I can see that in about three weeks. I can't see that younger than that, you know? Other people may be better. And then these are fish I didn't keep. And if you could see that and clearly, you would say, oh, I see. You know, the, the tail's the tails like this instead of like this in relation to the body. Or it's off one side or the fin's twisted. Uh, so in three weeks, you can tell if the fish are swimming correctly, if they have split tails, if the one side is lopsided, 
uh, all these other strange little deformities you get. And those fish, the first sort, is generally about 50%. And, and if you, you can go through them fairly quickly. So there's typically multiple calls. These fish are the same fish that we saw in the previous slide. <coughs> and they're kept. And uh, you then re-look at them and say in another two weeks. And I don't know if you can see this, but you can see the twisted spine in this fish and you can see this fish, the tail's fused. And so we missed that the first time around, and those fish would be further sorted away. And um, these are BBRs, black baby ranchers, and they're not black fish at all, but that's what we call ranchers before they color up with BBRs. If you see people talking about BBRs, black baby ranchers, they're not talking about black fish. They're talking about red and white fish or red fish that are uncolored. So then they color up and they're called CBRs, colored baby ranchu, and um, they, they tend to sort very easily. Uh, most people want red and white fish, and it's really odd. Uh, the red fish are show better, I think, in most cases, but uh, if people call me up and they'll say, oh, can I get some fish? Sure, you can get some fish. I want all your red and whites. And, it doesn't really happen. Uh, one of the rancher growers in Fresno, um, this was a fish I shipped, and uh, this was in March 1st, 2017, and this is progression uh, every month, uh, or almost every month, and then this is in August. So you can see the fish grow very, very quickly. This fish is probably five weeks old, and then at a full uh, six months, the, the fish is looks like a real man shoe. <clears throat> the fish, once you've called them for the back end, in other words, the tail, the peduncle, the split, the way they swim, you next focus on the nose on Ranchu, and you have to get that square. And you have, there's only a couple ways to do that. Green water really helps, but if it's, it, it, you know, it's difficult to do green water correctly inside. So if you had them this size, which is, you know, about an inch and a quarter, an inch, something like that, you put them outside, you get them in green water, they filter the green algae, through their gills as they as they breathe, and that that high protein, uh, high highly pigmented mix, then gets their head their wind to grow. You can also feed them uh, bloodworms, usually frozen, uh, and you can do dry bloodworms, and uh, it aids in getting the fun pan, which is the the corners on a rancher head, that that square part, these little bubbles out here. Uh, can you stand up? Matt, turn around. So, uh, see the little <laughs> balls on the top of his, on the top of the mouth? See, see? on either, either side of the mouth, that's the fun tan. That's the most difficult piece. And so, you want to get that correct. And, thank you, Matt. And, and so, uh, to get that, we, we typically blast them full of bloodworms every day. And you say, well, gee, the bloodworms are this big. Well, a lot of rancher breeders will start off after the first call, and they'll take a chunk of uh, the frozen bloodworms, and they'll put them on a piece of cardboard, and take a single edge razor blade, and, and slice them up into tiny little slivers, and then feed them slivers of bloodworms that are just defrosting. And you can, you can beat that. The other thing we do now is that we take uh, freeze-dried bloodworms, and put them in the egg mix, and we'll make them in the egg mix so they're even steamed eggs with bloodworms in it, and that's all helped to uh, get them uh, grow that fun tan very much, very much quickly. Um, so, 
You can jam as much food into them as often as you want. Uh, most people feed a minimum of two times a day. Some people are crazy and feed them eight times a day. And uh, mine get uh, the 15 minute rule. If they haven't eaten in 15 minutes, you fed them too much or they're not feeling right. And so, um, you, you typically, if they quit eating, it's time to change water. And some days, you just watch them and you do nothing. You know, feed them and you wait for them to become more active. And you do that and make sure that you, the tank water system is right and they don't have some type of mysterious protozoan or something. Uh, lots of fish, especially ranchu, demand blood worms. Uh, it's really difficult to do some of the, uh, any of the fish without head growth without feeding them blood worms for some reason. Um, and we've all gone to steam bags for the most part. And <clears throat> things like rapashi or homemade gel food, people are using and people are mixing rapashi <coughs> um, with um, <coughs> steam bags. And it works well too. Um, some of the uh, ranchu foods from Japan, <coughs> like uh, Akari, uh, the purple, has color enhancing in it. And even inside, you can get bright red colors by giving them uh, color enhancing food. And it's also it's got uh, when growth produce uh, improvements. Oh, it's really nice. <clears throat> Even when the fish are this big, we still run into issues with they swim wrong, uh, they, they, the, their spines tend to twist, and a lot of that has to do with ranchu, you know, the picture of the fish are like this, and all of a sudden they're like this, and when the chest drops, there's that tug uh, on the spine, and sometimes that spine gets out of alignment and goes crooked on you. And some some varieties, uh, you, you, that's a problem. You have this, you have 50 great fish and you're going, oh God, I kept 50 great fish. I'm gonna keep, it's, it's sell a few, give some to friends, whatever you're gonna do. And then you keep 20 for yourself. And then you look at them one day, and about a third of them have crooked spines. So that's an issue. So <clears throat> this is additional pictures of the same group. And you can see that, you know, over time, that head, that fun pan, starts to grow. And this part here, this plate-like structure, that you, the tail comes down and attaches here, and <clears throat> this is called the Oza. And a really nice top view fish developed this plate-like structure. And if you look at it carefully, it doesn't appear that there's any scales there, but there's scales that before the fin rays. And uh, the, the, some of the lines of ranchers, the, the oza defines the fish. It makes it easier to call the third. So it's left. <clears throat> different varieties have different requirements. And so ranchu and tosakin and butterflies are typically grown in water under six inches for the first six months. And that doesn't really say that's a, well, it's really difficult, difficult, difficult to get the water to circulate when the water's that shallow. And so if you don't do that, <clears throat> the tail pitch gets wrong. So if you grow ranchu, top view, it should be like this or like this, slightly up or slightly down. And if you have them in deep water and they have to swim to the surface to eat food or they chase pellets as they come down, their tail actually ends up like this. Same way with butterflies, you know, it should be flat. And then when they flip over, it should look like a butterfly when they're feeding, you know. Well, if you cause, they have too much current and the water's too deep, they end up using the ta tail, probably what it was intended to be for, instead of art and they uh, end up with fish, the tails are not flat. So, um, so if you're gonna try a new line of fish, the, the, the internet's pretty cool because you can get on Facebook and say, well, who's breeding Tosakins, you know, and, and or who's breeding 
butterflies, who's breeding top of your ranch you, and you have all kinds of answers in about 30 seconds, and then you just text those people and they say, what, you know, what depth, and you know, how much water, per, this kind of stuff. And, and so it makes a big difference and getting it right. You have all these beautiful fish, and people look at it and say, well, they don't look right. And it's, it hurts your feelings for them. So. Okay, part two, advanced breeding. So, one of the exciting things about breeding uh, goldfish, to me anyway, is that you can pick your own flavor, so to speak, in that you get up in the morning or, or you go down to the fish room after work and, and the fish are chasing and the males are driving the females. And if, if you're quick, you basically uh, look at the fish, make sure you get the right males and females in your mind. You, you get a bowl, a piece of tubware, uh, an old casserole dish, and you drain in about that much water. And you take all the fish that were in the chase, and you net them all at one time, and you put them in that bowl. Males and females, they're all squirming around there. It's only about this much water. And they're flip-flopping, and they can settle down pretty quickly. And then the, the trick is to understand who was chasing foods, because you gotta squeeze the males first. So the males, and, and the way I do it is simply, I, I cradle the fish with one hand, and use one or two fingers either side of the anus, a gentle push, not a big push, just you know, a, a gentle push, and the milk just flows out and you stir, fish in the hand. And then, after you've done that, <clears throat> you say to yourself, oh, I want to do this male too, so that you get another male. So you get milk from two males, or if you're really ambitious, you might have two or three buckets set up, or Tupperware, and you take that other male and you put him over here, and so you get milk from two of them, and then you know what the female was, because they were chasing her, right? And then you take the female, and you should be able to touch her and it comes out like a little tiny string of pearls and um, you basically as you're pressing lightly uh, you stir and as you stir uh, the eggs should distribute if you stir too quickly they get, they get all squirreled around if you just nice and gently um, they will they will uh, basically evenly distribute and not touch the trick is not to have so many eggs that they're touching each other. They touch each other, they just don't, they're, they're going to fungus out on you. And so uh, you, you gently touch them, squeeze them, and uh, then uh, if you want to do an extra male, or different colored male, or slightly thin variation, you move to the next one and do the same thing again. And it, it works well. Um, so male first and stir followed by the female stir. <clears throat> There's the fish, in it. all the fish are still in there. The, the males don't care if they're being stirred or not. And then you can't see that picture because of the lighting, but the eggs are evenly distributed and the, the fish go back in the tank. Sometimes you're lucky if it's a big fertile female, you go back in an hour and they're chasing her again and she's ready to do that again. You could either do the same fish or do a different one. And that's where the process starts. But um, a lot of the breeders that do lines, like uh, uh, myself and several of the people here, will do that cross. And then if they're ready to spawn again, we'll do an experimental cross. So you might try, oh, I've always wanted to do a short tailed Ryokin metallic to a matte fish and get calico fish. So you, you would do that cross as an experimental cross. So you have your, your first cross might be your line, and your next cross would be this experimental cross. So people say, oh, I don't know about this hand spawning stuff. And I can tell you that it's really easy as long as you follow the rules. And the rules are really simple in that the female has to be red. If the female's being chased and she's not ready, when you pick her up and you squeeze her gently, very gently, nothing comes out, she's not ready, put them back in the tank and go back later in the day, the next day, whatever. So, you know, they, they, they release uh, hormones, they get the males to chase them, 
but the eggs have not moved down the over to the ovipositor, and you just have to wait and be patient. I see people take pictures of squeezing and squeezing. You're just going to kill the fish. You know, the, the process of hand spawning is really simple and it's really easy. And people say, well, you're going to hurt the fish. A lot of times in, a, in aquariums that are relatively small and they're spawning, you kill the fish because the males have just chased them to death. So it's best. I like hand spawning. Uh, and you hand spawn them and you can do multiple males, you can do experimental process. It's much, if the females are ready, it's much less stress. Um, so, the advantage to mops is lots of spawning takes place at night, and lots of spawning takes place over hours and hours and hours. And so if you have mops, you, you often get gigantic spawns, especially with the, uh, uh, spawning mops, so environmental conditions. <clears throat> so we incubate eggs between 68 and 72 degrees F. If you do that, you get a good mix of males and females. If the water's too warm, you get all males. If the water's too cold, you get all females. And if it's really cold, you get nothing. And if the water's too warm, you often don't get split fins you would get all single tail fish. It's really kind of strange. Um, never feed the fish until the, 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 the fish are free swimming. You get all excited, that you finally got hatched, you're taking pictures, you're putting it on Facebook, you're telling everybody you got spawn, and the, the first thing you do wrong is you start throwing entrance in there, or egg, ground egg yolks, or you know, whatever that somebody tells you to do. And the trick is to wait wait until they start swimming. So, um, I add a small amount of salt in my tanks, about a teaspoon per five gallons. I can put live brine shrimp in there and not go back until the evening and the live brine shrimp that they haven't eaten all is still swimming. This is where most people screw up with baby fish once they figure out what to feed them because they don't change enough water. You have to figure out, even with tiny, tiny fish, how to drain 50% of the water off every day. If you don't do that, uh, they're going to end up with high bacteria or uh, ammonia killing them. And so it's always best to figure out how to, how to drain that water off. And there's several ways of doing it. <clears throat> I like to take a 3 8 inch diameter tube, about like that, and take a filter floss from an old box filter wrap it around with a rubber band and just start a siphon and siphon off the stuff and drain the water down 50% and then fill it back up. And um, I've got some DIY type stuff. This is a 20 gallon tank, which is my standard for raising fish for ranchers that need it and butterflies need very shallow water. I've just adjusted the standpipe tanks drill. I put a sponge filter up here and I don't do any siphoning. I just run water in and it overflows through the sponge into the drain and it's really easy. So this is kind of a ugly fish room picture, but this is the way it's at in breeding season in my basement. I have a rack of about 40, 20s and uh, all those post-it notes are breeding notes of all the tanks. I did. I gave up the 15 spawns point at one time, and so you know you get all these notes about what line this is and what the date is and who they came from. If I did anything special, so <coughs> questions? No questions. Somebody's got a question. Yes. Say that again. You mentioned the cultivation of green water. Yeah. Can you go into how that, you would do that or how it would benefit from <clears throat> Inside, it's easy, okay? Um, what I do is I'll set up a 20 gallon tank and put a standpipe in it and an air stone, no sponge filter. And then I'll take a couple dirty sponge filters from my other tanks and squeeze them in that tank. 
and then uh, Mike throw a couple fish in there, and, and um, you leave the lights on, and within a week you'll have green water. It's pretty simple. You know, outside, if you don't change water, 50% uh, of the water every week, you end up with the green water in about two weeks. And some people will do things like <clears throat> they have their outdoor pond, and they'll just bring the green water in from outside and dump it in the tank. And that works really easy. Uh, there's not there's not a huge amount of nutrition in green water in terms of growing the fish out. It's a great starter food, and it's great for getting square noses on fish that you want when grow. But if you're going to raise fish and only use green water, you're going to be disappointed. Somebody else? Yes, sir. Uh, Chris, bringing different varieties of fish, like a straight tail with a clip in. I've noticed, you know, I'm trying to do this, I'm trying to get a longer body fish. Yeah. That's more hard and hardy, and don't get the crap beat out of them by the other fish in the pond. Yeah. Um, I've had some success, but it seems like maybe 1% to 10% is all I get with the split fin. So I have to do the partial with the or is that just genetics? You gotta keep trying breeding back into the ones that mostly genetics. Um, if you have dissimilar history in the fish, and you're crossing, say, a Ryokin to a single tail or a Aranda to a single tail, you're gonna get single tails. They dominate. And if you don't get single tails, you get fused tails, and which is just as bad, really, because. People look at few scale fish and go, well, if it's not just often, you shouldn't be fused. So, you know, the, the only fish that's fused tail is the just So, <clears throat> it's it's a difficult task. Uh, if I was going to breed a superior single tail fish, and you wanted to start with something besides a comet or a Bristol, or I'd probably go buy a Tomasaba and start that way. Tomasaba. Thomas Ava to a comet, Thomas Ava to a crystal, something like that. Uh, do you ever use uh, uh, you know what they call instead of bright chimp, uh, Daphne on that? Yeah, I just, I just, uh, I don't have, I don't have the space. I live in the subdivision, you know, so. You know, uh, I had I had one Daphne feeding this year. Oh, that was it. Okay, I, I have I had a 300 gallon tub that sat up, aerated all winter, and had leaves in it. And I was going to use it to uh, quarantine some fish. And I just went like this and looked at it, and there were you know 10,000 Daphne in it. And uh, I spent the next hour taking all the Daphne out, feeding it to all my tanks. And then I'm done for the year. So you know, so it, 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 it do really well here. Yeah, well, I, I can see that, but you need a lot of you need a lot of water to, yeah. to, to do a lot of fish. You know, so you know, Bozal on the east coast in, in near Atlanta, they have a really big lake for growing daphne. Yeah. And when I say lake, it's a yeah. lake, you know, and so uh, and I'm sure they're feeding it special stuff to keep that going, you know, but um, it's not not an easy thing. Yeah. Uh, Gage, who's running around here, he's he's doing some Daphne work out here. It, it's doable, but, it, but you better have a backup, because when they crash, you don't know why, and it's right. not easy to start up. So. Thank yes. You so yes. Um, what can you say about different varieties Fry that you get they hatch. As far as like something that's larger, well, something tiny. Yeah. You know, I, I it would say I don't know. I've read a whole bunch of different types yeah, of stuff, did, okay? Yeah, Jenkins Jenkins are by far the tiniest fry. Yeah. And by far the most difficult because they have really, really small mouths. And, and uh, if and when I'm successful doing Jenkins again, I'll probably buy that strain of San Francisco prime trip eggs that has really tiny uh, uh, fry. Um, I, I would say the older the fish, 
the bigger the eggs and bigger the fry. So if you're going to breed arandas and you buy a bunch of really tiny arandas and they get up to this big and they all spawn, your eggs are going to be pretty small, the fry are going to be pretty small. And so if you look, talk to Jeff Thompson here, he, you know, he breeds ranchu and they typically don't necessarily breed their first year fish. In other words, the fish is a year old. They don't breed it that first year. And if they spawn, they don't collect the eggs. They wait till the second year. You know, they call first year fish tosai, second year fish nisai. They typically are breeding nisai or oyas, which is three, three or an older fish. And the reason for that is the eggs are bigger, the fry are bigger. They seem to have less, less deformities than a smaller fish. So, uh, I don't know, I think the most challenging ones next to Jenkins are black ranchers. So getting them black is, is difficult. If you don't have outdoor sunlight, uh, getting them lanophores to migrate to the surface so they have black fish. I guess the other thing we all make a mistake doing if we have indoor hobbies is that raising fish in glass tanks is really, really difficult to preserve the, the initial colors. And so if you are going to raise fry, I would raise them in concrete mixing tubs. You know, the, if you go to, uh, down to King Floyd, there's black tubs that are on the ground. Those are concrete mixing tubs from Home Depot or Lowe's. <coughs> you know, they're really inexpensive, but they're black. And if you're gonna raise fry, the, the background should be navy blue or black. Otherwise, the fish will come up in color and all the blue fades. And you, you don't get really deep colors because the fish are mimicking the color of their environment. And so <clears throat> if you have a really bright white tank, white gravel, white bottom, white tub, clear uh, tank, clear bottom, you're gonna get lightly colored fish and you're, you're gonna be disappointed. So uh, uh, a dark colored tank pretty important. I don't know if that's helpful. You said something earlier about, you know, when you were talking earlier about uh, UV lights or something getting darker fish. What was that? I, I was... Uh, uh, reptile lights. Reptile lights. Okay. You know, infrared lights. When you have dark colored fish, especially black ranchu or black arandas, if you expose them to a black bottom tank and infrared light continuous they'll be black at a very early age you won't have these bronzy colored fish how about like uh, pandas and i don't have experience with them but the logic suggests that the black uh, the black background on calico fish <coughs> is dependent on the color of the bottom of the tank and I think the infrared light would probably help. Infrared, so outdoors helps too. Yeah, yeah as you, you just outdoors. You have all the other predator type things going on. Is, is it is it less effective to have outdoors or have indoors with a? It's way more difficult. You can't control the temperature. You 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 can't control the the bugs that are eating the fry. You know, there's nothing worse than growing, releasing a whole bunch of half inch fish into your pond and they get up to about an inch long and then all of a sudden they're all dead because the dragonfly larvae oh, yeah. you know oh, yeah. so so it, it's it's always a trade-off right so, yeah. and you, in these shallow concrete tubs out in the sunlight you cook everything so very so, it's very difficult would you say a greenhouse would be a nice compromise in most situations i do i have a greenhouse i use it seasonally in Ohio, it's really difficult to keep them in that, in that greenhouse, even with uh, shade and windows open and forced ventilation between the end of June and 1st of September. In the it, summer, a greenhouse is unacceptable here, it's but just, in the winter. It, it's yeah. just, in the winter, uh, an unheated greenhouse, we did really well until it got to 10 below zero. And so... Does it happen here? 
<laughs> so well, we we, uh, we we just turned on the heater uh, for three days until that cold cold passed. But you know, heating heating them uh, fifty degrees uh, and. It, it, it's not all that expensive. It's, it's expensive to heat the greenhouse, but if you would, if you were going to raise fish in the greenhouse in the winter time <clears throat> in tubs or big tanks, the way you would do it is to have covers, <clears throat> electric heaters, and turn those when it's cold, turn those heaters on, put a cover on them so there's no evaporation, no loss of heat, and then you have to go through the the issues of taking the covers off when the sun comes out. So, and if you look at all the uh, rancher growers in uh, England, and they're kind of crazy for putting them in greenhouses, they do it all over the place. They all have went overnight covers. They don't heat the greenhouses, but every night they go out and put styrofoam covers on every one of their tanks. And then every morning they take them all off. So, doable. Who else? Anybody? You mentioned salt in the when they're babies. Bare babies. Yeah. The brine shrimp will have. Um, is that? Do you measure that with a refractometer, or you, you just? I'm just yeah. curious how you figure that out after a few water changes. Are you putting it in your water changes water ahead of time? No. Okay. So. And do you keep it in there after they switch the pellets, or are you put the salt in after that? No. Just only when they're turning. Right. So, you know, the fish will take up to a teaspoon, uh, actually, they'll take up to 2.7 teaspoons per gallon, no problem. So one teaspoon per five gallons is really pretty easy, right? Yeah. So, you know, once you figure out the volume of your tank and you lower the water down, fill it back up, your question is, how much do I got to add back? And I buy... Um, well, actually, I was wondering how close you needed to keep that. You don't have to be close at all, okay, is the answer. Um, but uh, I don't think high salt concentrations for goldfish is a really smart thing long term. You end up with dropsy, kidney failure, all these other issues related to them not being saltwater fish. And so, you know, I basically will drain all my tanks down that have babies in them, fill them back up, and then go back and say, okay. And then they each get a teaspoon of rock salt. And uh, I use. Uh, it's a blue bag at Home Depot. It's called Solar Salt. It's a, a rock salt used for water conditioners, and, and you find out all the fish hatcheries are using the same brand. And and so, it, it's it's just salt, you know, and nothing special. I see all these people arguing about you got to use aquarium salt. You no, know, uh, you got you know, I, I don't use iodized salt. I have used iodized salt. I don't see any difference. But uh, you know, I don't use iodized salt. I just buy. Uh, solar salt, solar rock salt, <clears throat> and you know, a 40, 50 pound bag, something like eight bucks. Yeah. You know, lasts me a long time, even my hobby. Day. And I use it for raising my brine shrimp eggs, and I use it for uh, keeping my salt, you know, in, in my tank. Yeah. Um, where, what temperature do the goldfish typically start breeding at? Coming out, you know, winter. I've noticed them down as low as 60. Yeah, I've seen 60. The difficulty with the, the 60 thing is that the eggs take too long to hatch. So you get out past four days and you start having issues with what sex you're gonna end up with. And then you get up about six days and the, the, the they just don't what they just don't do well. So okay. what's optimum temperature? 68, 72. Okay, and um, I've noticed the males Typically, they stop to hunt after about 75, um, or they shoot blanks, you can't get you know, you give them squeeze and that. Is that typical that if the water warms up? And well, they get over the males having milk is all dependent on the females. Really? Yeah, they're, 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 they're really releasing pheromones. The pheromones are stimulating milk production. And so the females, as they go through building eggs, they're giving out pheromones and the males get active, okay? And, and so the, the act of breeding, the males have already been primed. So the females are not interested in breeding when it's too warm. Okay. So the males, they need to bring the temperature down basically to get them to breed a 
second time or a third time? Start oh, I don't know. It's it, it's not that's not true. It, it's all what line it is. You know, sometimes you, you'll have a line of ranch shoes and they'll they don't breed this year, and next year they'll breed five or six times. You know, really? and, and yeah, and then some people. Uh, will spawn their fish heavily one year, and the females just don't have any more eggs, so they don't breed again, you know. And then uh, I've got a line of Shonka Moors that I bred. They bred the same females bred five times this year. And, and, and each spawn is not gargantuan, 300 eggs or something, right. but, it, but it works really well, you know. And, and so I, the, the line and the individual fish make a big difference on how many spawns you get. Uh, can that also be varied by how much if your hands fall out by not overdoing it? If you overdo it, you have a bad, uh, yeah. people have bad, less than 90% take on a hand spawn are probably expelling too many eggs. And, and so too much pressure and they're getting eggs that aren't quite developed. So you take the male and you uh, you spawn the male first in the water. Gen yes. Gently. And then need to be done right away the female. Uh, a lot of people, when they first start with hand spawning, screw up by, by, by trying to follow the rules. Okay? And so you take all the fish and you put them in a bowl. It's really simple. Okay? And they're all in there. And the biggest thing you had to do is remember who was who. Right. You know? And if you're not sure, you're kind of screwed because it. If you if you do the female first, chances are the eggs aren't going to uh, aren't going to uh, hatch. And the reason for that is the eggs come out of the female, and they're something like half millimeter in diameter, and within three seconds they're a millimeter. And that when they swell, those eggs hit the water, they swell, and that's when they absorb milk. And so you only have a couple seconds once the eggs are in the water. How long is the milk available? That's a good question, but. Generally, a couple hours. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. That long? Okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I thought it yeah. Sooner. If you watch fish spawn over a, a long period of time, you watch carefully, and you watch them spawn in a mop, and they'll chase the female through that mop. I don't know, two right. dozen times. Right. And every time they go through, the males, the males are putting milk in there, and the females ready, but the eggs haven't been moved down the ovipositor yet right. and so they're just going through the motions until the eggs get pushed down the canal so to speak right. and when they're ready then the eggs come out and the milk's already there so it, you see with these uh, cheerleader pom-pom spawny moths that the fish the females sometimes go there to rest because they're you know you put a couple of them together it's pretty big and it's comfortable and the, the, they'll lay eggs in there and squeeze out eggs with no males chasing them. The milk's already in the water. So. Yeah, I've noticed, you know, with the bumps on their cheeks and the bumps on their fins. And, yeah. they, and sometimes, you know, they'll disagree, disagree, but that's all pure hormonal. It has nothing to do with the temperature of the water in that. It's more Generally hormonal. not. Um, and so if another female came in, they might, they would, Within, you know, if she were ready to spawn within a few days, having them in there interacting, he would come back in the mill. Absolutely. Yeah, that's why you have difficulty if you have a big system with a bunch of tanks and you want to do an experimental cross. Say you want to do a, you're breeding Narandas and you want to do a, you want to see what a, you can create a young bow by trading or putting a Ryokan into an Aranda and you bring over your best Ryokans after you've done your Randa cross and the female's ready and the males don't have any milk and they were in a different tank. Okay. Anybody else? Back row? Just being comfortable back there? Okay. All right, I thank you all.